Welcome to the second episode of Let's Live with the Youth Council. Today's episode is going to be focusing on gender and discrimination. We are delighted to have Holly Grimes and Sky Smith as our guests who are here to give uh, their perspective on this subject. <laughs> What does celebrating International Women's Day mean to you? Okay, so celebrating International Women's Day basically, to me, means that we can celebrate all the awesome work that females do. International Women's Day is to celebrate and recognise all what women have done for us in industries, any type of industries like sport industries, outside the sport industries as well. All the women in my family inspire me because they've helped me become the person I am today by support, confidence. I agree with you as well, Dan. Yeah, same here. For me, I think it is really, really important. I think as much as we should celebrate women every day and it shouldn't just be a one day a year thing, I think it's great that we do have a day where we can really sort of amplify their voices and, and the great work they do. And I think, you know, it is something that's still necessary. So... Yeah, big fan of International Women's Day. Yeah, I agree with um, everything that's been said, really, and kind of not it just only being women that we know, but our role models as well, and um, kind of celebrating their successes and kind of using that as motivation as well, I guess. Do you think female players face discrimination in football? Yeah, I think probably is the easiest way to say it. Um, I think you can kind of um, zoom in on different aspects of it. So you've got kind of like fans, coaches, media, players, officials. And I think there's definitely going to be stories in that of where women have had to go through um, discrimination and those kind of um, aspects of it. Um, I think kind of as a, someone that, um, as a fan, a coach, someone who's played football, um, someone that looks at it on the media as well you can kind of really see that and uh you kind of I, I guess you kind of empathize or you you've ha- you've had those experiences so you can kind of see where where people have been coming from and in terms of how what they've been doing is has challenged them and how that's kind of been an experience which they've had to learn from um yeah I think that again in like the professional game as well you can really see it um even with like say the likes of Alex Scott and Karen Carney who have kind of I feel like they've had to take the brunt of it um quite a lot of the time and that's kind of where social media can either I guess make it or break it in a way um but yeah it's a something which I'm sure has only gotten better but there's still a lot a long way to go with that as well. The the one um thing that springs to mind is the incident that happened a few years ago when um, Richard Keyes and Andy Gray said what they'd said about Sean Massielis. Um, and in my opinion, that should never have been said. Um, we, should, we should have been in a society back then when it was accepted that um, female officials w- were the norm. She was brilliant back then and it's still brilliant today and, ref- and officiates in the Premier League. Um, so I think that sort of discrimination really needs to be stamped out because it should never have happened. And unfortunately, it's still happening in 2021. I completely echo everything that's already been said, really. I think we have come a long way. And something that I've sort of been educating myself on recently is the, the ban on women's football. So the 50 years were in England, 1921 to 1971, I think it was, where women's football was, was banned on FA licensed pitches. And I think since then, we've just been sort of playing catch up. And I think in the last five to 10 years, I've really seen as I've grown up, I think women's football has developed massively. Obviously, we've got a professional league now. We have more and more representation in the media and in sort of high level, you know, technical roles as well. But I think there's still such a long way to go. I think like Sky said, I think you only have to look at social media to see that a lot of people still don't value women in football and with Emma Hayes where she was talked about for the, the Wimbledon job and she sort of said well why would I drop down to the men's league one when I'm coaching the best players in the world at the moment yes they're female but they're still at the top of their game so I think I think we've come a long way but I think females definitely still face some forms of discrimination. So do you think that the um, issue around Alex Scott um, becoming depressed because of the pressure that she's under being a female pundit in the men's game, do you think that that kind of needs to be celebrated? Yeah, I think that um, kind of just to take 
gender out of it and see as her as a brilliant a brilliant pundit like why does it matter that she's female that she's kind of sat on match the day or covering um various games like why the fact that she's a female when she's like a hundred percent qualified for it um like she she speaks superbly on that I don't think anyone can Mm -hmm. like like can fault her on that I just don't I that's what I struggle to understand from people that will then go onto Twitter and send her abuse because like she she's just so she's so professional she's got all the knowledge for it she's got the experience for it and she does a great job Karen Carney um anybody that is kind of covering sports even as a female covering a male sport or the other way around just see them as a pundit take take gender out of it and because it is it is irrelevant really pretty much like like other when they're playing football on the pitch or in the pundits box they have an awesome game like like like, like everyone cheers them all but it guarantees Sky said when you go for the Twitter you guarantee you get one person who has to pick up being bullied where like we all should celebrate like how well that that uh, woman's played in football or how well they've c- covered on the matches it all depends on the generations yeah. of like it's always best to educate when young to make make the future a be- better and brighter place so basically we have a mix of women in our team and male mm. yeah, we keep it fair and square mm-hmm. I, I can agree with Louis there. Does social media help or hinder discrimination in football? Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's one of those ones where it's like, uh, when it's great, like it's amazing. But when it's going bad, it's kind of, you want to avoid it. So even with things that kind of watching say a WSL game and you see a player like a goalkeeper make an absolute blunder you're kind of like oh because you know that there there will be people out there which are going to pick up on that and that will be everywhere for that one blunder that they've made in that one game that's like that's them done then and then that's like just people that are behind accounts um kind of using that as their cover um to then just go send abuse or just kind of belittle what they've done and all the amount of training that they've put in for that that will be the one thing that they've zoned in on and um, that will be it then they'll anytime you bring up women's football it'll be like oh but have you seen have you seen that that or the yeah. bad save that they made when it's just completely irrelevant so when it's when it's when it's bad um i think that it is it is really awful and there's not really much that you can do about it and i think that that's where kind of social media and social networking sites need to be responsible for that as we've seen like um, I think it's at Facebook and Instagram are now kind of trying to tackle down on um, especially like racist um, abuse that's been going out at players but uh, as on a positive note I think that it really can um, kind of involve anybody into the game open you up to, to so many different communities um, that go with that um there's yeah there's different ways that you can kind of connect with people which you'd never connected with before um there's a lot of information out there as well which you you wouldn't be able to see maybe on an, any other media so kind of thinking you're not really going to see any of those um accounts or information on television but you that's where you can find it on social media and then all, along with that is like being able to share stories and experiences as well um so yeah i think it it can help it but at the same time it can hinder it as well so it's it's a 50 50 i think you can guarantee if, if like one player has had a good match they score like 50 goals in the match so we have 50 nil <laughs> they miss one penalty you guarantee as guy said that be on that they won't, they won't get the 50 goals they pick up that one missed penalty they'll discriminate you for anything mm-hmm. on that social media i've witnessed quite a lot of it um say so like on so I've scrolled through Twitter and like uh, I follow a lot of Premier League sides on there and I've just not commented on anything like that I've just scrolled through it and think oh my god why would you do that why would you like discriminate any anybody like that do youth councils and youth organizations need to do more to educate young people on social media I think you can change perceptions as you get older, but I think it becomes more difficult because mm. they're more ingrained and they're more sort of internal. And I think if you can educate people when they're younger, I think that's only going to help. And I think that's where organisations such as youth panels and youth councils do come in because, you know, we're, we we do this and we volunteer because we want to make a difference and we want to make sort of football a more inclusive place. Um, and I think often 
when you look at sort of an inclusion advisory group or board at, at a county FA, it can sometimes not have enough young people's voices on it. And I think that's where we come in to make sure that anything they're doing to try and make football more inclusive is also aimed at young people and is also educating young people. And, you know, I don't think you, young people just have to educate young people. I think young people also have a responsibility to use the fact that they've grown up in such a sort of tolerant and open-minded society to also educate older people as well. In junior football, should girls be allowed to play in boys' teams and boys play in girls' teams? My honest opinion is they should be able to until they're... Um, until they get to the age of 14 and then it should be split into um, male and female because that is the current ruling. I don't see that there's any um, thing to suggest that it should be changed from 14 onwards but I'm not saying that everybody else in, on this call will have a different opinion. I agree with you there Cam, totally agree with you. I think the most important thing for me in, in youth football is that the players happy and that the players sort of feels welcome and like they belong in that environment and that it's you know a safe environment for them to put, for them to play football i think when i was growing up like where i lived there wasn't really any girls teams so i played with boys from the age of maybe 7 to being about 12 13 14 and then i felt like at that point for me i should go and find a girls team and that would be better for my development um and i would be happier I think it helped me in some ways. I think it toughened me up a bit and I could get a ball in the face and not cry because I've been playing boys for, for five years. Um, but I think, I, I do agree that it probably does need to be a point. Um, and if a boy just wants to play in a girls league so he can run rings around him and score 12 goals every game, then maybe maybe not. But I think you have to look at why and I think we can always make an exception to the rule. And like I say, I think it's just about the individual player and making sure that they're happy with whatever they're, they're doing. After those five years of you playing with boys, were you happy to move on into a girls' team to make new relationships with a set of girls? Yeah, I think, like I say, I think my reasoning was more for playing with the boys was just there wasn't really an opportunity for me to play with the girls. Yeah. Um, it's not even that there wasn't. I wasn't really aware of it. I don't okay. think it was as well sort of promoted back then. And, and um, It was my local team. And to be honest, like a lot of the boys I played with were from school and I always felt like for the most part I felt comfortable in that environment but sometimes mm -hmm. I felt like it was often the other teams would be like oh they've got a girl on their team yeah. like um she's they're obviously not going to be very good and then I felt like when I went to a girls team and then I probably because I've been playing with the boys was one of the better players then it, mm -hmm. it was like a confidence boost and um yeah. I think probably did feel more like welcome and like I belong there but um, I still kept training with the boys and, and they were really good in that sense as well that they were very much like come as long as you want and I think I was probably 15 or 16 by the time I stopped training with them so Go on, Holly did you two feel like you got um, played with boys league compared to your girls league pretty much okay. yeah I feel um, as what Holly said um, kind of did toughen you up a little bit just mm -hmm. because um, as a coach now I'm able to I can quite easily tell the girls that uh play with boys more often than they play with girls they're a lot more um not like not badly aggressive but they're more willing to kind of fight for a, a free ball say for example and they're they're more, yeah they're, they're more willing to kind of get into those uh maybe situations that I've seen that a lot of girls maybe wouldn't be as comfortable in but I think that's just purely because that's how that's what they're taught to do um so yeah, I'd say that it, it toughens you up, and I think even say looking at um, like the WSL compared to the Premier League and the like, kind of the differences there is there. You can kind of see that from um, quite a young age. But um, yeah, I'd say that the main one is kind of more of a physical thing, um, and yeah, maybe a little bit more mentally with, uh, so, yeah, again as Holly said, getting uh, hit in the face or whatever, and just being able to cope with that a bit better. <laughs> Should transgender people be allowed to play in male and female leagues? That's a really interesting com um, question considering we've got um, the Trans Week of Action that this month at the end of the month. So that's a really, really interesting question. And to be fair, I kind of think that um, you should play for whatever um, gender team you identify as in terms of if you are 
female, you should play for, for if you identify as being female, you should play for a female side. If you identify as being male, you should play for a male side. Also, if you identify as a female or male, you should also mostly concentrate on what makes you happy. For me, I think, you know, trans women are women, trans men are men, and I don't think we need to treat them any differently. Um, I think if we think about football, particularly at like a, an amateur level, and the reasons why we all play football, it's, you know, physical health, fitness, mental health, the social aspects. And I don't think anyone should should miss out on that, I, you know, because they're transgender. I, I think we all deserve those those benefits. Um, I think people don't always realise the, pr- the procedures that are in place as well, for, especially for trans women to play in a women's league. Um, they do have a lot of like paperwork and a lot of sort of rigmarole to go through to even be allowed to do that. Um, and I think I think something that people don't always think about is like people's arguments would be that if you're a transgender woman, then you're going to be stronger and faster and more physical. But those don't necessarily make you make you a great footballer. And that's the case among women as well. You know, I'm, I'm five foot three. So if sometimes I'll turn up on a Sunday and I'll be playing against a six foot centre mid and I know she's going to win like every single header in that in that game. But that's just a natural sort of thing. And that's part of life. Um you know, not everyone you play against is going to be exactly the same as you. So I think, I think that I think my main concern is, is whether society is at a place for that to happen. Um, I still think we are quite transphobic because of society, and there's not a great understanding of of the issues around it. Um, so I think it's great that there are sort of LGBT inclusive clubs like Charlton and Victor, and that do sort of create a really, really safe and inclusive environment for those individuals. Um, but for me, like, it's not really a question. I think they should definitely be allowed to. I think it's great that we can all agree on that. Um, but again, I think it comes down to what we were saying earlier about a generational divide. And I think me- maybe the generation above us are, you know, just not to, not to generalise at all. But I think it's great that our generation are so, so open and inclusive. But I think football as a whole has a long way to go before it's, it is probably safe and inclusive for trans people. Do you know of any initiatives that the FA currently have in place for equality? Um, so in like one of my previous roles as a women's football apprentice, um, we work towards the, ga- uh, the game plan for growth, um, which the, the FA implemented a few years ago now. Um, about kind of doubling participation and then uh, doubling fans as well being one uh, two of the main goals um, and I think with that um, as I think that it definitely has been able to kind of work and that's been built on um, and then you can kind of see that from if you look at a national level the amount of people that say went to Wembley to see the England versus Germany game and I think it was November 2019 where they was it like 70,000 people were able to fill Wembley mm. that's kind mm. of something which is kind of that product of that which I think is incredible and uh, being able to build on that and then kind of push for more so that it's kind of like a given um, that you're kind of if you support England you that England is that whole bracket if that makes sense um because yeah I've um coached in a school and I know that I've spoken to like girls before and I've been like oh this was previous to Covid been like oh are you are you going to watch like the England game tonight they're like oh like my my dad won't let me watch um the women's football because he doesn't want to watch it and then you're just there you're like why like what like what is the justification that you've got for that um or like how do you like what then do you say for a young girl who's in my football session that then wants to go like if she wants to be a fan like where does she then go like she mm-hmm. that could then exactly pretty much squash that passion or which she just may be starting to kind of ignite um so yeah I think with initiatives like such as the the game plan for growth and kind of focusing in on not only the participation side but the fan base as well is something that kind of can kind of like open up your eyes I guess to hopefully having that lifelong passion for football as well. Do you think that county FAs and the national FA Youth Council are doing that by doing the initiatives such as the Black Lives Matter workshops, all of the workshops that they're doing around um, the le- um, FA Leadership Academy, all of those types of things and the direction that they are going in this year is allowing young people to have more of a voice and that is especially being shown through the regional youth network and I think that the more young people that can be on that network the more um, opportunity young people will have 
to go and get themselves heard, whether they are from a small county like ours or a massive one such as Manchester. What could be done to grow the game within the football family? Example, disability, blind, women's football. When I um, interviewed Harry the, the other week, that was the whole kind of thing that we talked about is the fact that um, disability football isn't always um, accepted for what it is um, in terms of you've got fans who want to go and support other nations. His He actually admitted to us that um, his own mum, when he was at the championships, went and supported Australia because she was given an Australian shirt and decided, I like the colour of the shirt, I like the people, I'm going to go and support Australia when her son was playing for England. It was actually in an FA steering group where where they are looking at ways of getting young people with disabilities back into football. But I do also feel that it needs to be looked at from a gender point of view as well, in terms of we need to be looking at how we can get young girls back into football and potentially grow the game um, following COVID because we that it might be that um young girls want to go and play football now that they've seen the likes of alex scott being a pundit and being a former player they might think oh she's gone and done that i want a slice of that pie so to speak it all goes back to that generation thing yeah if we, if mm-hmm. we can get that the, the old-fashioned generation bubble and pop it and create our own generation bubble make it a bubble that everyone's accepted and welcome then keep that bubble solid then we will get out, we'll, we'll be a better place. Do the actions of some football fans at games have any impact on younger people who attend? I think that, you know, like um, what your, what is said at football grounds needs to be um, stamped out in terms of there is a lot of things that are said um, by football fans when um, before pre-COVID that wasn't very nice. Um, at football players and I think that when that is said young people under the age of 10 say will think that that's acceptable because they can hear it in a foot in a football ground when in actual fact it's not acceptable yeah and the amount of conversations that I've had with people around this and the fact that it should be stamped out is unbelievable and I really think that we as young people have um, the opportunity to change that in terms of we need to be allies and go out there and say no this isn't acceptable and I think we have the opportunity to do that so we need to start doing it and we need to start doing it doing it now before it's too late and those young people grow up and say oh I heard that when I was little so it's acceptable to say well in actual fact no it isn't. Mm. Yeah I agree with you there Cam. Yeah, I can you. I add on to that as well? Um, I think that uh as a as a woman that um enjoys going to football matches um obviously when we can um i think it'd be very easy for someone who's kind of new to that environment to be really really put off and feel really uncomfortable and could easily get very ext- like extremely upset over what has been said at football matches as you say cam so like hearing chants that are very derogatory towards women and mm-hmm. being and looking around and being the only woman about it's really uncomfortable to think that these people might not even mean it as well. They're just saying it either just to be one of the boys at the football because they've got this persona that they need to be the hard man cheering about someone which on the pitch that they can't even hear you. Like, it's, I think it's, it can be, really be damaging towards um, any girl that is in, in that environment. And so, yeah, to take that away um, kind of from the stadium and then I think kind of not feeling safe in that stadium or that environment, then you're automatically could be put off um, for, from football for life. You're already going to think, I don't want to go back to that environment, um, like would not want to invest your time or your money into it. And then that's mm. kind of where already, even at a young age, that could just that's then stopped forever just because of something some some bloke said that he doesn't he probably doesn't even mean that he's just shouting it as a part of this group um not really taking into account other people that are around them the number of young referees going from youth football into senior football is dropping why is this i think it is down to abuse um i think what what's what's awful is that a lot of the time when i've been playing um 
it's not been the it's not been the players abusing them. It's been the parents, okay. and a lot of the time it's parents of kids who are like eight, nine, ten, and you think yeah. it's just yeah. you're like the kids play football, and genuinely I've seen like. 40, 50 year old adults shouting at like a 16, 17 year old referee and I just think it's it's really not that deep. Like Yeah. Um so yeah, I think there's obviously like probably a lot of reasons and we can't just put it down to one factor, but I do think that it's almost not worth the abuse that they get, um, for just trying to, you know, do something that's good for themselves and, and essentially helping clubs out because without referees there'd be no football. So um yeah. Scott, Scott have you got anything to add? Yeah, I think with that, um, as Holly said, like the abuse that they'll get from parents, but then it's also, I guess, um, if you went to go and referee a senior game, um, knowing that probably all of those people have at least some sort of social media account and the repercussions that then could be shared online um, compared to kind of like where you'd hope that, say, under 10s don't have um, access to that. But yeah, just kind of knowing... um, what what could happen i suppose or like knowing that as say as a, a a new referee or a younger referee um going into a senior match and knowing that a lot of these players could be older than you um it, i can imagine it being um really kind of i guess a bit quite of a patronizing environment as well to kind of be walking like even even like back to the car park for say um knowing that all of these people are kind of watching you especially if a decision a decision hasn't gone their way um could be really hard and really quite daunting um so yeah i think yeah as a, for from going to youth to senior football um the abuse that they could face um not just on that pitch but then yeah elsewhere coming off the pitch and on social media as well have you experienced any discrimination either personally or within football i was in lempster near the co-op and this kid assaulted me he was abusing me he tried to put me on the ground he did it again a couple of days after how did that make you feel feel though so it made me feel like i didn't want to go to college and yeah down ethan have you experienced any discrimination i have actually yeah go for it tell us your story uh, in primary school it was at a very young age they were discriminating against my disability because i have cerebral palsy down the left side so some person decided to discriminate my disability and make fun of me i've got many stories of when i've been <laughs> discriminated against for my, my disability also i've had i wear pedro boots i've had people call me frankenstein i used to wear a hearing aid because i used to be deaf in one ear and they used to be can you tune into the radio but i always just think to myself as i got older and i i met some amazing people throughout my life I always think, I always say to the bad people, if you could only pick one thing out about me that's wrong, I must be pretty awesome in other departments and all that. <laughs> Guy and Holly, have you ever experienced any discrimination? I wouldn't say I can think of like, I can pinpoint one incident. I just think like, you know, as we go through our lives as potentially as women and just in other aspects as well, like you do, you do sort of face it. And I think it's a societal issue I think like everyone here has a story to tell and I think it just shows that as a society we need to be more tolerant of others and and celebrate our differences rather than trying to put people down and um I think I think for me like sort of I've got a really really good friendship group who are really supportive and then I think also becoming involved with like the the FA network youth network I think has been great because I think I've met some really like-minded people and just people who want to make football and society a better place so like I say, just, just about celebrating our differences rather than putting each other. Yeah, mine's the same, really. I, um fortunate enough never to have really experienced anything directly. Um, but yeah, I think, um, as Holly said, that kind of being part of different networks and different groups, you've really, um, really been able to kind of hear and kind of listen to other people's experiences and kind of learn from those and hopefully help um, gain the knowledge to kind of combat those and um try and make make society and the world a better place with that as well um so yeah i think it's as much as you can like i'm very grateful that i have never had to go any 
go through anything like that um also like listening to your guys' stories and kind of seeing how that um needs to be changed and yeah working towards that to to help other people as well everybody pretty much is not born with a racist attention discriminative attention but they can be changed that way if you've been affected by anything talked about on the podcast, you can get more information on our website at www.herifitsurefa.com. Thank you both to Holly and Sky for joining us this evening as our guests. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you again to my awesome youth council. And um, that is the end of podcast two on gender and discrimination. Um, we look forward to seeing you for podcast three. <laughs>